Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Black History Month 2024, Spotlight on Transportation Safety in the Black Community. It has been a busy Black History Month this year, and I, for one, am glad that we had the extra day to fit it all in. I want today's webinar to live up to its position, capping off the month. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Transportation Safety Board, and it will last approximately one hour and 45 minutes. And to get the most out of it, I want you all to remember one thing. History is not a list of names and dates. History is all around us, built, to our, built into our present lives. It is in the steel and the asphalt bones of transportation system. It is in our prioritization of speed of vehicles over the safety of people. It is in the sidewalks and intersections, treatment that we build and that we choose not to build. It is in the, it's in an award that America won in part in Tuskegee, Alabama. America trained the Red Tails or Tuskegee Airmen. We can't make the future better unless we can see our present. And to see our present, we have to see, to really see our history, all of it, the good and the bad. I am Nicholas Worrell, your moderator today. I'm the NTSB Chief of Safety Advocacy. My job and the job of the advocacy team is to advocate on behalf of NTSB's recommendations, which are based on facts to improve transportation safety for everyone. But when facts require change, sometimes we'd rather not hear them. It's the same with history. Black history often include those hard to hear facts. Naturally, we tend to focus on the positive in black history like famous firsts and the great black contributions like James Herman Bannon, the first black person to fly across America. And by the way, also the great uncle of Dr. Phil Hart, one of our panelists today. Garrett Morgan, pre-position stop signal. Meredith Gordine, invention of the catalytic, the catalytic converter. Andrew Jackson Beards, real car coupler, a safety improvement that saved lives. And Elijah McCoy, McCoy's device to automatically lubricate steam engines on locomotives and ships, engines which previously had to be stopped to be oiled. That invention was copied so much that it changed our language. It inspired the term, the real McCoy. Yes, Black people affected transportation, but transportation also affected Black people as well. From the iniquity of, slave, of the slave trade and the travel conditions for Black in the Jim Crow South, to the inequity of today's unequal burden and road safety fatalities, we are irregrettably not equal. The scale is smaller and the cruelty might be unintentional, but today's transportation built on our history has feel somewhat filled the Black community. Black people remain overrepresented in road safety, roadway fatalities. And vehicles, non-Hispanic Black die at a rate of 73% higher than that of non-Hispanic whites. Black pedestrians die at a 118% higher rate, growing to 236% higher at night. Road development have divided neighborhoods with sometimes deadly consequences. When roads and speed are unsafe, safety suffers. This is just one input into the gap in road transportation safety between Black people and others. No, we're not equal, although safety community want us to be. They want zero death in transportation for us all. That is an equity goal. To talk more about the statistic, we will hear from Leah Reich, a transportation safety data analyst from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Then we will turn to the changes needed for a brighter future with Veronica O. David, author of Inclusive Transportation, a manifesto for repairing divided communities. And speaking of the future, I believe the children are our future, as Whitney Houston sang, and that will lead us to Safe Kids Worldwide President, Tareen Creppy. Tareen develops and implements strategic initiative, create partnerships and inspire behavior change to keep kids safe on the road and elsewhere. And I've already briefly mentioned Dr. Phil Hart, an award-winning educator, author, and filmmaker, and a leading authority on early Black aviators. 
He is also the brother of former NTSB chairman, Christopher Hart. You can find their bios in the chat box and on the event page on ntsb.gov. I also ask that this panelist look back at our present as future black history to talk about how we will get to a better place. Each panelist will deliver a brief presentation finishing with an invitation to the next presenter. Audience, to make sure that we are connecting with you, please enter your questions in the chat box. Once our panelists have presented, we will take as many of your submitted questions as possible. So first up is Leah Reese, Transportation Safety Analyst. Mrs. Reese, take it away. Thank you, Nicholas. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Reese, as mentioned, and I'm a Traffic Safety Data Analyst in the Data Reporting and Information Division um, of the National Center for Statistics and Analysis at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, one of our newest fact sheets, the 2020 Race and Ethnicity Fact Sheet. So our agenda, we're just gonna look at the topics that we talk about in the fact sheet. So introduction, we're gonna look at some data definitions in the uh, data system that we use. So overview of traffic fatalities by race and ethnicity, a look at occupants, non-occupants, some behavioral factors, additional resources, and then I'm going to conclude from there. So this fact sheet was actually prompted by the technical report titled Evaluating Disparities in Traffic Fatalities by Race, Ethnicity, and Income, which was published in September of 2022. And in that technical report, we discussed 2014 to 2018 uh, FARS or fatality analysis reporting system, final FAR da FARS data uh, with the race ethnicity data. So this one is to use our most recent final uh, FARS data, um, which is published 2016 to 2020. And so you see the word final in bold. So our race ethnicity data, we obtain it through official death certificates. And due to this, it's only fatalities that we receive in our FARS system. And because we gather it from the official death certificates, there's also a delayed availability. And due to this, we use our final FARS data instead of what we call our annual report file, which is what we would typically uh, publish first. So our final FARS data just has a little bit more complete uh, race ethnicity data. And the term race ethnicity you'll see throughout my presentation, uh, we use this as to, to refer to the combined classification of race ethnicity data. So these race ethnicity groups right here, these are the ones that we use in, in our FAR system to classify um, our race ethnicity groups. But these are also based off of the OMB uh, race ethnicity reporting guidelines. So there were guidelines that were uh, published in 1977 and then revised in 1997. So the 1997 OMB guidelines are the most recent ones. So these groups are based off of that. And they are currently rev uh, revising that, but it is not due to be revised at least until the summer of this year. And with the OMB guidelines, they define ethnicity as a distinct concept from race. So because of that, anyone who is Hispanic or Latino could also be any of the race groups. And you can also find additional details of this in the appendix of the fact sheet. Looking at an overview of our traffic fatalities by the race ethnicity, you can see that we have the, we're comparing 2016 to 2020 and the fatalities population and then the fatality rate per 100,000 population. So for the Hispanic or Latino population, there was a 20% increase in the fatality rate between these five years. For American Indian Alaska Native, there was a 23% decrease. For Asian people, there was a 34% decrease. For Black or African-American people, there was a 19% increase between these five years. For Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander individuals, there was a 74% decrease. And you can see the asterisks there. We do want to note that this uh, data should be interpreted with caution because these are low numbers and we have some data acquisition issues within the states. And then for white people, there was a 13% decrease between these five years. So looking at occupants and non-occupants, so overall about 66% of the total traffic fatalities were motor vehicle occupants, 20% were non-occupants, which would be pedestrian and pedal cyclists and other non-occupants, and 14% were motorcyclists. So motorcyclists would be the passenger or the rider in the, um, of the motorcycle in this case. 
So there were 23,914 passenger vehicle occupant fatalities in 2020. And a passenger vehicle is defined as, or we define it as passenger cars and light trucks with a GVWR of 10,000 pounds uh, or less. And you can see the breakdown of the six groups that we were looking at. They're 51% for white people, 18% for Hispanic or Latino, 17% for Black or African American, followed by American Indian Alaska Native at 1%, Asian at 1%, and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander averaging 0%. So there were 822 large truck occupant fatalities. So the breakdowns were pretty similar to how it was in the overall passenger vehicle occupant fatalities. A 53%, 16%, 14%, 1%, 1%, and 0%. For the motorcyclist fatalities, as I mentioned, these are the rider and the passenger. There was a slight increase in the white uh, people fatalities at 60%, followed by 14%. 11% for Black or African American, and then the 1% uh, or lower for the other three groups. So for the uh, 6,565 pedestrian fatalities, you can see that there's a slight difference in the uh, percentages. The white um, people fatality percentage went down while the Hispanic or Latino and the Black or African American percentages went up. Also the American Indian Alaska Native and the Asian uh, people, uh, fatalities for pedestrian fatalities went up as well. And there were 914 pedal cyclist fatalities, and it's a somewhat similar breakdown to some of the other groups, 51%, 17%, 13%. And in this case, the Asian um, pedal cyclist fatalities were a little higher than the American Indian Alaska Native and the Native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander at 0%. So we're gonna look at some behavioral factors. First, we are gonna look at unrestrained passenger vehicle occupant fatalities. So these are the passenger cars and light trucks, as I mentioned. So the group of columns to the left, though this is overall passenger vehicle um, occupant fatalities. And then you can see the two groups to the right, uh, grouped for just passenger cars and then grouped for just light trucks. And I have circled the Black or African American um, percentage compared to the total percentage in these in the remainder of the slides that I have circles. And you can see that for Black or African Americans, they had the second highest percentage of unrestrained passenger vehicle occupants killed at 61% compared to the 51% of the total. For passenger cars, it was similar at 60% versus 47% for the total. And for light trucks, it was 64% for Black or African Americans and 55% for the total. And I do want to note, you can see the 100% for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. So like I mentioned before, uh, consider the small fatality counts. So in this particular graph of the passenger vehicle occupants, it, um, there were eight that accounted for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander um, occupant fatalities. And one of those was a light truck occupant who was not wearing a seatbelt. So for the next two slides, I'm gonna show alcohol impaired driving fatalities and also speeding related fatalities. I did wanna note that of these two slides, these are the, the race ethnicity of the fatality. This is not the race ethnicity of the driver. So we only acquire the race ethnicity of fatalities. So if the driver was not a fatality, this would not be captured here. In the black or African-American uh, group, there was 32% who were alcohol impaired driving fatalities compared to the total of 30%. For the percentages of speeding related traffic fatalities by race ethnicity, you can see that the black or African American people had a 33% uh, percentage of speeding related compared to the 29% of the total. So some additional resources, we have a, uh, state-level race ethnicity data on our website. It's called NHTSA's State Traffic Safety Information. You may have heard of STTSI before. So that's actually the link, cdan.dot.gov slash STTSI. Um, if you ever look up our NCSA tools, which I give the, I'm gonna give the link in a moment in the next couple slides, you can go to the state level if you wanted to look at any state-level race ethnicity data. 
And I already mentioned the technical report, the evaluating disparities in traffic fatalities by race, ethnicity, and income. So this technical report explored the disparities in traffic safety in the US of these different race ethnicity groups. And that's the link you can go there. You can also look up um, the DOT HS number, which are the last six numbers, the 813188. And I did wanna note that the 2017 and 2018 FARS final data may differ between the fact sheet and this technical report because there were amendments done to those two files after the publication of the technical report. And the last resource I wanted to provide was the OMB's 1997 standards for maintaining, collecting, and presenting federal data on race ethnicity, also known as SPD 15. So I mentioned it a little bit before, that's where we get our uh, definitions for the race ethnicity groups. So they are currently revising that. It's set to be released around summer of 2024, but if you want to uh, follow the process, you can go to spd15revision.gov. And to conclude, I'm gonna talk about a few of the limitations with our data or other data sources. <clears throat> so race ethnicity reporting differs by source. So I did mention for FARS data, we acquired the race ethnicity data from official death certificates. So that would be reported by someone else. And then for population, uh, we get this based off of the census. So that would be self-reported data. So there could be a slight discrepancy between those two. Race ethnicity reporting also varies by state and year and the number of unknowns varies by state and year. So for example, if one state uh, tends to account for substantial number of one of the race ethnicity groups in one year, but then the next year there was a high number of unknowns for that state, it could impact the fatality rate. There's also time lag in receiving the death certificates, uh, reporting issues, and sometimes we have data acquisitions within the states, so not being able to acquire the data. And the third one, uh, multiracial people could be misrepresented. So until data year 2019, FARS used to report the first race that was listed on the death certificate. And starting in 2019, um, we broadened that to where we can identify uh, more than one race um, ethnicity on, listed on the death certificate. So it allows for more accurate data for multiracial people moving forward. So right now we can't reliably uh, estimate the impact of traffic fatalities on multiracial people. And I just wanted to say thank you. If you ever have a data request for NHTSA, you can email ncsarequest.dot.gov. And that link below is the one that I mentioned about our NCSA tools, publication, and data. And I'm gonna hand it over to Veronica. Hey, good afternoon to half of the country and good morning to the other half. Um, okay, I think my slides are up. So my name is Veronica Davis. I am the author of Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities. Um, and this is my how I can be reached uh, via X, Twitter, whatever it's called now, at Veronica O. Davis. And then my website is veronicao.com. Um, I really want to thank uh, Leah for giving that uh, introduction. Um, and I won't go too deep into the data because I think she did a really great job of laying out the challenge. And I just have in here the pedestrian deaths for uh, 100,000 um, by race and ethnicity. This was in Dangerous by Design put out by the National Association of City Transportation Officials. But again, it's to um, outline the, just the overall challenges. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is well, how did we get here? Um, and so I have some photos and I'm sure many of you have seen uh, streets like this in your communities. This is a photo I took in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we have overbuilt our infrastructure um, for many, many years. And so this is a end result. This is a typical street that you will see on what we call the high injury network where people are dying and being seriously injured. Um, there's a photo of a very wide street with a school bus um, and you really gotta look to even see that there is a person standing out there waiting for a child to come off of the bus. Um, this is a photo from Houston. Um, and what we do see in some cities, uh, particularly in places like Houston, where there is what is called an open uh, drainage system, um, usually ditches, 
um, or as a way to help facilitate the drainage movement. Um, you'll see it in Houston, you'll see it in places in Florida. And so what happens is now you have this um, tension between drainage and making sure people's properties aren't floated and mobility, um, places to put sidewalks. And so it is not uncommon um, to see photos like this where you have a older woman in a wheelchair having to ride her wheelchair in the middle of a two lane road. Um, this is from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and so as we talk about health and, you know, we want people to go out and walk, but how do you walk when you don't even have the sidewalks available to you to safely facilitate that movement? And then lastly, this is a photo from Rockville, Maryland. And even when we have a complete street that has sidewalks, um, that has a little itty bitty buffer zone, there's also transit on this particular roadway, it is still a very wide street. And often what happens on this street, they end up on the high injury network because of where the bus stop placements are. You know, the bus stops are to facilitate people getting to from work, grocery stores and everywhere they need to go. And what tends to happen is the bus stop is in the middle of the block. And so for someone to be able to use a, a signalized intersection where there's a traffic signal or something available, they're gonna often have to walk a half a mile out of the way. And human nature says, we're not gonna do that. They're gonna take the path of least resistance and often dart in the middle of the block. And that is where we have a lot of crashes on these types of roads. And so when I look about how we got there and how we designed our systems, just to give a little history lesson, particularly on this last day of Black History Month. Um, so this is a quote. This is one of the earliest quotes and mention of that defines what the American dream was. This is from 1931. And the quote is, life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to their ability or their achievement. So this is the first definition that we see in the United States about the American dream. But when you Google American dream ads, and this is a screenshot from my computer, I didn't make up these ads, you tend to see a white family, um, a husband, a wife, a little boy, a little girl, uh, they're in a vehicle, they're maybe standing in front of their house, um, they have a pet, a dog or a cat. And that was who the American dream was for. There's one photo in this entire Google image um, that has people of color. And so this is um, a food line uh, from 1937, where you see people of color standing waiting. Um, and in the background is this uh, marketing image that says world highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. And so it really shows the juxtaposition of who the American dream was for. And just to give a very, very, very high level segregation timeline, um, this is so important because when you think about the decisions that were made, you have to understand what was happening on the backdrop of the United States. It is very easy to look at history with the, 20, with the present day lens and we cannot do that. Um, so 1865, we have the end of the Civil War and it starts the reconstruction period within the United States. A key landmark event, which had to do with transportation, 1896, that is Plessy versus Ferguson. And that is where the Supreme Court upheld separate but equal. Uh, Homer Plessy was one drop rule a black man uh, and attempted to ride in a white only uh, car on the train. And so the Supreme Court upheld separate but equal. 1954, we have the Brown versus Board of Education, which under the 14th Amendment ended uh, separate but equal. But there was a lot going on then. So then you still have another 10 years before you get to the Civil Rights Act um, of 1964 that quote unquote, really ended segregation. And so I say all of that is, this is a map from 1960. So now that we have that background, most of our highway system uh, was designed and built in the 50s and the 60s. And so at that time, most of your planners and engineers and all of that were white men. Um, and so this is a map of 1960 of East Baton Rouge. Um, this was showing where they were trying to lay out the route for Interstate 10, which today connects Florida to California. Um, the neighborhood that you see here was mostly Black and Italian. And again, this goes back to my point of you can't look at a present day lens. 
in the 1950s and the 1960s, Italians were not considered white. When you look at redlining, when you look at protective covenants, when you look at segregation, people who were of Irish, Italian, and Jewish descent were often included in that. So there were protective covenants that if you were Irish, Italian, or Jewish, you could not live in certain neighborhoods. So this was a Black and Italian neighborhood. On this slide, it's a slight zoom in. Um, I have an arrow going to the north, an arrow going to the east. And so that property, um, my great grandmother lived on the front of that property. And then my grandparents, and including my mother, lived on the back side of that property. And so as we think about the impact the highway system has um, on this, you know, that was where my family uh, lived. And my mother uh, remembers she used to go to St. Francis Xavier Catholic School. And she was the last graduating class um, from that Catholic high school. And then it was torn down in order to facilitate the construction of Interstate 10. Um, and so this is a picture on the left. It's a photo provided by my mother. It is my uncle uh, standing at 961 uh, Myrtle Avenue. Uh, I, as a child, went to that house. So up until I was about eight or nine, my great grandmother lived in that house and she was the only house underneath the highway. All the remaining houses on that block uh, were removed. My grandparents, as well, along with my mother and my aunts and uncles, they were displaced to a different part of Baton Rouge. Um, and then eventually my family did sell uh, my great grandmother's property to the corner store next door. And on the right is a photo of what that property looks like today. And so it is a park um, that is supposedly to reconnect and facilitate um, that type of a community. Um, but oftentimes it is these communities where we typically see those high injury networks and things crop up. And so where do we go from here? Um, I'll just give a little bit, and I know we have more as part of the discussion. Um, but we talk about equity versus equality. And this is um, a graphic that many of us have seen at many of our conferences. And so equality, it's three people attempting to see actually a Kansas City Royals game, which I'm not sure who would want to watch that respectfully, but it is um, three people attempting to watch a baseball game. And so the short person is unable to see over the fence the person in the middle can see over the fence by standing on their toes. And then there's a person who can see over just fine. And so equality is everyone gets the same. Each person has one box, but equity is everyone gets what they need. And that is where um, each person is standing on a box that facilitates their ability to look over the fence. However, many of us who've worked in government, whether it be local, the, uh, the regional, state, federal government, we all know that the, the needs exceed what is available in the resources. And that is people, that is time and the financial resources. And so when I think about equity and what I pose in the book is as we look at solving some of the challenges around safety, particularly in black and brown communities, we actually need a different approach. And so what I provide is a framework of the emergency room. Uh, when we all go to the emergency room, we arrive, we sit with a nurse and we talk about why we are there. It is an intake process. And within that, the nurse is trying to decide where you fit in the priority scale. And so if we all come in with the same ailment, we'll be seen in order. But if someone comes in because they were in a crash and they may be you know, in a very traumatic situation, they get bumped up the priority list. Um, they are dealt with and you know, handled and being and stabilized before moving on to other patients. And so we really need to, and it's hard, I'm not going to say it's politically easy, but it is hard and we need to take the hard choices to be able to make the investments, the investments in infrastructure within black and brown communities where we know there is a high injury network. If you look at any city across this country, if you look at where people are dying or being ser seriously injured, it is usually in the black or brown, lower income neighborhoods of that particular area. And so we really have to have the courage and bravery to be able to prioritize these areas in terms of investment for safety, whether it's going after federal money with the Safe Streets for All or any other or the Highway Safety Improvement Programs. 
really making sure that we're prioritizing that area. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I really love the slides um, that Veronica used. I um, appreciated how she framed it and um, had the storytelling. So uh, I'm gonna jump in um, and really speak to how we work at Safe Kids Worldwide. And our goal is really to protect our youngest pedestrians, riders, bikers, and walkers. And so when we think about um, the infrastructure and looking back historically on how safety was built for transportation, I think you heard in Nicholas opening about um, Rosa Parks, you've seen the work that has happened around the streetlights and you've also heard about redlining. And I think in order for us to grow and we start with our history, that helps us to impact our societal you know, outcomes. And so one of the things we are thinking about at Safe Kids and the work that we do, and especially how we think about it in our community, in the black and brown community, and you hear often it takes a village. I will tell you in road safety, it is the same, and it will take a village for us to make change. And so through the work that has happened through Department of Transportation with creating a safe systems approach, we at Safe Kids are saying to ourselves as we think about our future, how do we create that safe system approach on our roadways as a shared responsibility? And as you see here, that includes all of those key constituents that are noted here. But most importantly for our work, it are the community members and entities and partners that we look to build, especially as we work in historically marginalized and underserved communities. And when I think about that, for so long, it was a lot around black and brown communities, but as we have new immigrants coming into the com our communities, we have a Hispanic community, we have rural, we have urban. There is a holistic system that we need to think about as we address the inequities around transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, as I said, we spent um, many years in transportation at Safe Kids, really looking at how to protect and prevent unintentional injuries to children. And these are the years and time that we spent in the work. But what I want to point our attention to is in our work in bike, child passenger safety, and pedestrian safety. Most importantly, what we try to do is we provide advice in the work and how to protect and prevent unintentional injuries. We really want to look at how do we create changes in their infrastructure as it relates to pedestrian, in child passenger safety, how do we provide a device without education? And that could be a car seat or booster seat. And in bike safety, how do we provide a helmet to keep the family safe? We know in those communities, the challenges around being able to provide these access to the use to keeping their kids safe is needing the support. And that's where our work come in. This past year and just yesterday, we have launched our equity and child safety strategic plan. The goal in that plan is really to address the inequities, but most importantly, look at how to meet families where they are in the community where we're seeing the most injuries and fatalities. Our goal is that if we're able to protect every child from a preventable injury, especially on our roadways, we know that in prioritizing these efforts, we will make a difference. And so how we're going to do that is we have looked at almost every community through an index that we'll be sharing shortly. But what I want to do is not recapture a lot of the data that Leah did, but just really to show you the disparities around Black Americans, Black pedestrians, and most importantly, the non-Hispanic Black consumers. And looking at when most recently with micromobility, the e-bikes that's on the road and e-scooters. You can see there's a new increase of injuries that we're seeing with those that are in our communities. Safe Kids has begun to look at how do we address these inequities and how are we gonna do that is using our injury risk index. Our team has looked at zip codes nationally across the US, align that with the US Census data. And our goal is to go granular into the county level 
of really looking at the unintentional injuries among children, zero to 19. And in looking at that data, being able to address how do we make change, whether it's in biking, walking, riding, and most importantly, reducing those risks. Right here in DC, those of you who are in our area know that Ward 7 and 8 is an area that has a lot of risk, especially around infrastructure. We have done quite a bit of environmental work in those communities where, and just in school zones, there were lack of zebra crossing for kids to know where to cross. There were a lot of incidents around mid-block crossing and kids being hit. So one of the things we wanted to do was really understand if we wanna make a difference in communities nationally, and this is just an example here in the DC area, we needed to better understand where those injuries and where those fatalities were happening. We know those of us who live in that area that in Ward 7 and 8 in Washington, DC, which is broken down by eight wards, that those are two critical areas where we see the highest risk. In our index, what it's telling us is those three zip codes that you see there, they are very high risk for unintentional child injury death. And that just doesn't include transportation, but those are other injuries that are preventable. Additionally, we looked at those zip codes and identified what schools were in those zip codes to better understand the number of kids are in schools. For example, you see there's 26 schools that go to grades fifth, there are six middle schools, and then there are three schools that combine elementary and middle school. That allows us to know where we need to go to do the education, but most importantly, understand through some of the hospital data as well, what are the injuries and fatalities that we're seeing on the road. And what we learned from that assessment was that there were a 94% very high risk within those three zip codes. I think I may have time, but I wanted to show you how when we go into a community, we really look at the whole community. We look at how to partner with all of the community, whether that include the government, community organization, schools, and most importantly, the families who live there. I believe Nick is going to drop in the chat this video link so that you can see how we included everyone in our work to really trying to make a difference in a community, and most importantly, communities around this country that need help and support. A lot of times communities are being changed, not with including a community, but coming in and making change where people are either forced to move out or transportation is being built through their communities. And we wanted to see how this school where we saw kids being hit, we saw that the transportation areas the areas around the school had lack of school crossing guards. It had lack of zebra crossing, but we brought the entire community together to make a difference. So I'll end with saying that in our communities, especially a lot of times families do not feel that they have a voice. And our goal in working with communities is to give them that voice to really be able to express the changes that's gonna happen and help them learn how to advocate for making a difference. And now I will turn it over to our historian, Dr. Hart, to talk about aviation. Thank you, Toreen, for your very fine presentation. Um, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Philip Hart. Uh, and before I uh, get into my uh, remarks, uh, I have uh, three slides I want to show. But before I get into my remarks, I just want to uh, uh, in terms of the things that uh, I have written or the films that I've uh, produced about uh, early African-American aviators to uh, let you know that you, what you can do is just uh, search Philip S. Hart, uh, Early African-American Aviators. I have uh, written uh, two books about children's books about Bessie Coleman, uh, one book called Flying Free, America's First Black Aviators, uh, a film, a uh, documentary film, Flyers in Search of a Dream, that was uh, aired on PBS in 1987, uh, Black Wings, which aired on the Smithsonian Channel in 2012 and was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Uh, and my most recent project is the uh, Centennial Report for Long Beach, California Airport, the oldest municipal airport in California, 
that was founded in 1923. Uh, we uh, just completed a um, centennial report with historian Allison Rose Jefferson that you can uh, find on the Long Beach Airport website. Uh, and uh, my family's been involved with the uh, aviation industry for 100 years. And as uh, Nick uh, uh, referenced, my uh, younger brother, Chris Hart, uh, served as the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board during the Obama administration. And uh, Chris, uh, one of his memories growing up, we grew up in Denver, uh, Denver, Colorado. One of Chris's memories growing up is that uh, our mother telling him that the first thing that he drew was an airplane. And he went on to become a, a licensed pilot, uh, earned his law degree at Harvard University, earned his aerospace engineering degrees at Princeton, and um, uh, became a pilot. And so we've flown together uh, in private planes around the country for 50 years probably now. Um, so my family's been involved in the aviation industry for uh, nearly 100 years. And Nick uh, referred to in, in his opening remarks, my mother's uh, uncle, James Herman Banning, who grew up in Oklahoma, uh, was the first African-American pilot licensed in the United States in 1926, and then was the first uh, African-American pilot to fly across America in 1932. Um, but uh, I wanted you to know that it's, e it's easy to access my books and my films and uh, uh, also a, a recent podcast that my wife and I did on Bessie Coleman. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is uh, uh, transportation safety, but really look at aviation safety and look at uh, what that means from uh, 100 years ago to today. So if we if we can bring up this, the uh, first slide on Bessie Coleman, uh, Bessie Coleman earned her license in France on June 15, 1921. Uh, Bessie Coleman um, grew up in Waxahachie, Waxahachie Texas, and uh, went to Chicago when she was a young, a young woman to live with her two brothers in Chicago. She was uh, um, interested in learning how to fly, but she couldn't find a flight school here in the United States to teach her how to fly. So uh, uh, upon the recommendation of the Chicago Defender publisher, Robert H. Abbott, she learned how to speak French, uh, went over to Paris, uh, and earned her license on June 15th, 1921, as you can see on this slide here. Uh, she earned her license two years before Amelia Earhart earned her license. And most of you who are in this uh, audience today know who Amelia Earhart is. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know who Bessie Coleman is but she earned her license two years before Amelia Earhart earned her license. And in the Long Beach Airport report, Centennial report I, I, I spoke about a few minutes ago, I, uh, I talk about both Bessie Coleman and uh, uh, Amelia Earhart because they both uh, uh, flew over the uh, skies of Southern California back in the 1920s. Um, the uh, Bessie Coleman Aero Club uh, uh, one of her one of her goals, Bessie Coleman's goals, was to form flight schools for uh, black people like her uh, in the United States. Because, like I said, she had to go to France to earn her license, and so she wanted to be able to. Her main goal was to uh, open flight schools in the United States. So she, uh, when she came back from France uh, with her uh, pilot's license, her international pilot's license. She uh, became a barnstormer and she participated in air shows around the country, raising money uh, and doing lectures at black churches and uh, other places in black communities, raising money to, uh, to try to achieve her goal of opening a flight school. Um, Bessie Coleman um, uh, 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 was prepping for an air show in Jacksonville, Florida in late April of 1926. Uh, she had a second-hand plane. Most of, most of the uh, black uh, pilots during that time had second-hand planes and had no, uh, um, uh, no commercial uh, sponsors for their activities. So she was prepping for an air show in Jacksonville, Florida. Her uh, mechanic, uh, William Wills, uh, who was a white guy, and it was unusual for a, a white, uh, a black woman pilot to have a white mechanic in those days, but she had a uh, William Wills was her mechanic. 
So they were prepping for an air show on April 20, uh, April 30th, 1926 in Jacksonville, Florida. And there, uh, Bessie was, um, uh, look, uh, if you understand how the, where the pilot and the co-pilot sit in the biplane, she is sitting in the, in the, uh, in the front, looking out, uh, scouting out, because she's going to do a uh, uh, parachute jump as well. And she fell out of the plane. She didn't have her her, her uh, seatbelt on because she was scouting the, uh, the 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 ground below to see to get a good view. So she fell out of her of the plane and died in a crash on April thirtieth, nineteen twenty six. And so um, in those days, there was very very little. Uh, uh, attention paid to safety because if you were if you were flying in those days you're flying uh, secondhand planes off at times if you're a black pilot and there's very little interest uh, very little focus on safety so a lot of the pilots like Bessie Coleman crashed due to accidents like in her instance uh, where a, a rod in the engine and uh, the engine stalled and she fell out of the plane and, and perished on April 30th, 1926. Um, but she uh, she inspired many of those who followed her. And, and when I was growing up in Denver, my uh, mother and my grandmother and my aunt used to show my brother Chris and my brother Judd, my cousins, uh, photo albums. And we see a, a photo of uh, uh, James Herman Banning, my, my grandmother's youngest brother uh, and my mother's uncle. And James Herman Banning was standing in front of a, of a biplane, and uh, his biplane was called the Miss Ames because he had uh, gone to Iowa State College as an engineering student in 1919, and he learned how to fly in, uh, in Iowa. And so when I saw these photos uh, as a, young, a youngster growing up in Denver, I, I always wondered who inspired my mother's uncle to become a pilot. And it was I, as I grew, grew older and did a little more research, I found that it was Bessie Coleman, who was who was his inspiration to want to learn how to fly an airplane. Um, and so uh, after Bessie Coleman uh, passed away, many of those that were inspired by her uh, took up her, her uh, dream of forming a flight school uh, for African Americans. And so the uh, Bessie Coleman Aero Club was founded in Los Angeles in 1929 by a gentleman named William Powell. Uh, and the Bessie Coleman Aero Club was the first uh, Black-owned flight school in the United States. And uh, uh, William Powell, who was a veteran of World War I, uh, 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 was born in Kentucky, but uh, his family moved to Chicago when he was very young. So he grew up in Chicago, was a World War I veteran, uh, and he, was, he be got bitten by the aviation bug uh, when he was in France uh, after getting out of, uh, after, uh, you know, uh, leaving uh, Europe in, in World War I. Uh, so he um, w also was trying to find a, a school to teach him how to fly, and he, he couldn't get admitted because he was Black. He eventually found a school in Los Angeles, that uh, the Warren Flight School, that uh, said they would admit him despite the fact that he was Black. So he moved from Chicago to Los Angeles, and he was an entrepreneur in Chicago, had several garages and a service station, sold those businesses, moved to, to Los Angeles, learned, got his license in 1928. And in 1929, he and Irwin Wells founded the Bessie Coleman Aero Club in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, they recruited James Herman Banning, who, who had flown, who had learned how to fly in, uh, in, in Iowa and earned his license in 1926. His license number is uh, 1324, which means he was the 1,324th person to earn a pilot's license, uh, and that was his pilot, his license number. But uh, uh, William Powell recruited James Herman Banning to come to Los Angeles to be the chief pilot for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. And uh, so he moved to L.A. in 1929 to become the chief pilot for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. And uh, in, in this slide here, you see uh, Thomas Allen on the left, James Herman Banning on the right, this is uh, uh, a photo of them when they landed at Valley Stream Airfield in, uh, on Long Island, New York, on October 9th, 1932. They had taken off from Dicer Airfield in Los Angeles on September 19th, 1932. They referred to themselves as the Flying Hobos 
because when they took off, they had, they had a secondhand plane, an Alexander Eagle Rock biplane. Uh, they had $25 in cash and a stash of, of sun-made raisins. So they referred to themselves as the Flying Hobos. And they uh, plotted their uh, route across uh, the United States so that uh, w when they landed for uh, to, to fuel up and for, uh, for maintenance, that they would they would land in a uh, at an airfield that had a black community, so they would uh, they could go into into town and eat eat at a, a black restaurant, go to a black church, and uh, convince the pastor to pass the plate so they could raise some money to continue their the trip across the country. Uh, when they would have uh, forced landings. They may land some in, in a community that was not as uh, not as receptive to them, and they they were instances where they land in the cornfield of a white farmer. And in those days, it was unusual to see a, a plane flying overhead. Anyway, so 1932, if you uh, uh, if you were a, a, a farmer and you saw an airplane land in your your cornfield, and you run out there, and there's two black guys. These two black guys that you see here jump out of there. You're kind of like, wow, what? What? And you kind of shocked. So, the, for the most part, they received good reception, even when they had forced landings and, and good support. Uh, but like I say, they call themselves the Flying Hobos, and you can see these are two handsome guys. James Herman Banning on the right is my mother's uncle. Thomas C. Thomas Allen on the left uh, is uh, is uh, was a mechanic and co-pilot. Both of them have Oklahoma roots uh, and uh, uh, migrated to, to Los Angeles uh, in the 1920s because LA was a center of, of aviation activity uh, at that time. So uh, they were the first black uh, pilots to fly across America. And you can read about their exploits across uh, in this flight. Uh, Mark Wortman, W-O-R-T-M-A-N, I uh, did an article in the January uh, 2000 uh, uh, edition of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum uh, called the first black airman to fly across America. And that's a very good uh, source to read about their, their trip across the country in 1932. And in uh, 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 this past last year, last June of 2023, again, I said James Herman Banning, he lived in Ames, Iowa, which is where Iowa State College, now Iowa State University, is located. But he was an engineering student there. So this past June, June 2023, the uh, city of Ames, Iowa, had uh, decided uh, to rename their airport the James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport. So uh, Chris, uh, my brother Chris and I were there to represent our family with the renaming of the Ames, Iowa airport after uh, uh, my, my grandmother's youngest brother and my mother's uncle, James Herman Banning. So any of you who are, are, are traveling uh, through Ames, Iowa, uh, you'll see that the airport there is now called the James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport. Um, now in, in James, uh, like I said, the, they completed their cross country flight on Oct October 9th, uh, 1932. And um, October 9th, 2012, uh, was the 80th year of their, their flight across America. I had the uh, city of Los Angeles declare that James Herman Banning Day in the city of Los Angeles to, to mark the fact that 80 years after they, uh, they landed at uh, Valley Stream Airfield, that uh, the city of LA commemorated that with James Herman Banning Day. And I'll also, uh, uh, tell you to look out for uh, Newsday Long Island. The newspaper on Long Island is doing an article that's supposed to be published sometime soon about uh, uh, about uh, James Herman Banning and and and, and Thomas Allen. Uh, that'll be published in Newsday Long Island sometime uh, in a, in the very near future. And when they when these two guys landed in um, Valley Stream Airfield, they got a lot of publicity. The black press cover them uh, going across the country, but as they got closer to um, uh, Val to Long Island, uh, even the, the white press started playing, paying attention to, to the, their exploits. And on their last leg from Pittsburgh to Long Island, they landed in Pittsburgh and uh, they were staying at the YMCA in Pittsburgh in the black community and the, and the uh, uh, Robert Van, who was, who was a, uh, publisher of the Pittsburgh Courier and where it was working with the Democratic Party, uh, asked them 
uh, on their last leg from uh, Pittsburgh to Valley Stream uh, Airfield in uh, uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Long Island, if they would uh, uh, carry a, a, a bag of fl 15,000 flyers, this is when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was first running for president in October 1932. Uh, and if uh, Robert Van asked him if they would uh, be willing to, uh, as they flew from Pittsburgh to, to Long Island, to, to throw these 15,000 flyers across, flyers, banners across the countryside as they flew their last leg. So they agreed to do that and then returned the Democratic Party said they would, they would make sure they got back to LA safely. So, um, unfortunately, in February of 1933, James Herman Banning uh, died in a plane crash in San Diego. He was not piloting the plane. The pilot of the plane was a young uh, naval aviator who um, uh, knew who Manning was, but wouldn't let him fly his plane. He was, he was merely getting, giving Banning a, a, a short ride uh, in San Diego to pick up Banning's plane that he was going to fly in an air show in San Diego. And but the uh, the white uh, young white naval officer wouldn't uh, let Banning fly his plane, and and ended up I guess trying to show off and crash the plane and Banning. Banning was killed along with the the, the young uh, uh, pilot uh, on February fifth, nineteen thirty three. So he uh, he passed away again an accident, uh, and uh, brings up the issue of safety, air, aviation safety, and uh, uh, how little uh, focus was on safety during those those times. And it it was in April. It was in uh, nineteen twenty six when the Air Commerce Act was passed. And that was, a, that was the year that the United States first starts, started licensing pilots in this country. If you're getting a license prior to 1926, you had to earn an international license uh, like Bessie Coleman did, had to go to France to earn her license. But 1926, the Air Commerce Act uh, administered by the Depart U.S. Department of Commerce was, uh, uh, was uh, put, in, put in place. And that uh, began licensing pilots and also began regulating the aviation industry and, and, and really paying attention to safety concerns uh, so that pilots could be safe. And, and it, it, it also uh, kind of dampened the uh, enthusiasm for having air, air shows because of the, of the safety concerns of air, of air shows. So if we can pull up the, the next slide, uh, 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 the uh, colored air circus, the the first colored air circus uh, in the world was he held was sponsored by the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. First one took place on October thirty first, nineteen thirty one, at East Side Airport air Airfield in La in uh, Los Angeles, a uh, community that's now known as Montbello, uh, the East Side Airport. That first uh, all black air circus, colored air circus, as you can see, it was called, was so successful. Uh, that the uh, the city of Los An the the mayor of the city of L.A. John Porter, and the L.A. County Board of Supervisors approached the Bessie Coleman Aero Club and asked them if they could do another a second air circus to raise money for the uh, city of Los Angeles unemployment fund because uh, this was the the height of the Great Depression, and so William Powell and James Herman Banning and the other members of the Bessie Coleman Aero Club agreed that they would do a second uh, air circus to raise funds for the U the city of LA unemployment fund. And this, the, the recipients of the uh, unemployment fund were all those people that were unemployed in the county of LA, whether you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whatever. So this second uh, colored air circus took place on Sunday, December 6th, 1931. Here you see the, the, uh, the billboard for it. And you see Hubert Julian, who was a very famous aviator at the time. They misspelled his name here. They call him Colonel Rupert Julian, as you can see his name is, first name is mis mis misspelled. The five blackbirds, the five blackbirds were the first uh, all black uh, precision flight team uh, that um, participated in the air show. Uh, Hubert Julian is one of the five blackbirds. Marie Dickerson Coker uh, was the only woman as part of the five blackbirds. And so she was uh, a participant in these precision, uh, in this uh, precision uh, flight team. Uh, and you see it, only colored aviators. And you see the names there, Rupert Julian, Marie Daughtry, Daughtry, who's a parachute jumper, 
she, she, see Marie Dickerson, Marie Dickerson Coker. She was one of the members of the Black Five Blackbirds, like I say, a shoot jumper, aviatrix. Then you see Frank Sebastian's Cotton Club Orchestra uh, provided they they had big band entertainment and entertain uh, a big band doing a, a upbeat music. Then you see Clarence Muse. Those of you know something about early uh, black actors, Clarence Muse was the famous actor during the time. Clarence Muse was the uh, MC for the, uh, in, you know, the, the the air circus that day, the colored air circus, and the the, the Cotton Club. Going back to when Banning and Allen landed in Harlem, they were given the key to the city by the mayor of, of New York, and then they were, uh, uh, you know, celebrated at the Cotton Club in Harlem by uh, by Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington. Uh, and so then uh, that was in 1932, and this is this is 1931. You see, the Cotton Club Orchestra was here at the Colored Colored Air Circus, and those of you who've uh, who uh, may have uh, watched uh, the Perry Mason uh, series on HBO re uh, last year. Uh, one scene has this colored air circus, circus banner in the background uh, as part of the Perry Mason show. So the um, um, one of the, the goals of Black Pius during the 1920s and 30s, William Powell here in Los Angeles, Cornelius Coffee in Chicago was, how do we get black folks men and women involved on the ground floor of this industry they were visionaries in the sense that they saw that, that the aviation was going to develop as a major industry a worldwide industry and their goal a hundred years ago was how to get more black men and women into the aviation industry and as you fast forward to today we see that maybe three percent of commercial pilots are black so the challenge today is how do we get more similar to what they were, they were talking about 100 years ago? How do we get more black men and women into the avi aviation industry as pilots, uh, mechanics, owners, et cetera? And so it's still a challenge today as, as was expressed uh, uh, back in those days. And we do have some uh, HBCUs that are involved in um, aviation education today, like as Elizabeth State, uh, uh, Delaware State, Hampton, Tennessee State. So, but we we still need need to be pro more proactive today in terms of how do we be, how do we be get more young people into aviation careers uh, and 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 continue the dream that Bessie Coleman, James Herman Banning, William Powell, and Cornelius Coffee had a hundred years ago when they saw that aviation is going to be a very major industry. How do we get involved on the ground floor? Now, as we know, it's a major industry and it's still the same challenges ahead of us. How do we get more black young people, men and women into the, into the aviation industry? So I'll, I'll uh, conclude there and pass it uh, back to Nick. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate uh, everyone's presentation. Um, thanks to all the panelists. We're gonna wanna open up for some questions. Again, if you have questions, please drop them into the chat box. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Dr. Phil. I have one here. Uh, how can we get HPCUs more involved in the aviation education and the training programs? You just talked about that a little bit. Um, wh what more do we need to do as, you, as, you, as I travel around the world? Um, in different places, not only here in, in the U.S., there's a shortage of pilots, there's a shortage of engineers, there's a shortage of everything, I, I think. And there are people not only here in the U.S., Blacks not only here in the U.S., but across the world, Africa and different places that would be interested in, and love to work in our aviation field as well. Well, like I said, there are there are HB, HBCUs that are in, in, in engaged uh, in aviation education and training today. Uh, I think it's really how do we uh, uh, increase the pool of young people prior to going to college, whether they're going to an HBCU or another uh, uh, college or university or, or a flight school, to to pursue a career in aviation or engineering. If you look at the people that are that I referenced earlier, why did Bessie Coleman want to learn how to fly? She was inspired by Eugene Bullard, who flew for the for the combat for the French in World War One, 
he couldn't fly for the uh, United States in World War One, so he had to go to France to learn how to to fly for the French. She, he inspired Bessie Coleman. Bessie Coleman inspired my great uncle Germ, James Herman Banning, who got an engineering uh, education at Iowa State College. So uh, it, 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 we need to be more proactive in terms of getting the um, the the message out to young people that aviation is a viable career. It's a well-paying career, uh, whether you're a pilot or, or, or participating in some other aspect of the aviation industry. And I've tried to do that myself through my through the uh, like I say, I've done three books for young readers uh, about uh, Bessie Coleman and other other early after early black aviators. Done several films, and and then the the recently. Uh, my wife and I did a podcast about Bessie Coleman called Invisible Eagles, Bessie Coleman, that is available on Spotify and Apple and all the, the various podcast platforms. And we got uh, uh, Oscar nominee Covincine A. Wallace to be a uh, star as Bessie Coleman. So it's really a matter of how do we come up with ways to reach our young people? What mediums are our young people, look, uh, Black young men and women, uh, tuning in today that they can learn more about the opportunities in the field of aviation because they're they're a vast and uh as i as i've noted we've we've had people telling this story for 100 years so we've got to keep being proactive and reaching out to tell these stories and what are the opportunities that in the av are exist in the aviation industry but our hbcus are doing a pretty good job currently great great and and like i said um here at ntsb as well we, there are plenty of opportunities here and in the investigative area as well. Um, so uh, I wanna jump to another question, go back, move to the surface side of things here. Um, Toreen or Veronica or any, um, or Leah, what, what are the challenges? What are some of the other challenges that we're facing today as it relates to road safety in the black community? And, and you know, we are still losing 43,000 lives every year on the roads in the United States, over 43,000, we still have issues um, and we have, we have heard recently a lot of conversation around, yes, reaching underserved community, underprivileged, underrepresented, et cetera, the various terms. But I, I feel like we still have a lot of work to do on, on, on the road safety front in terms of reaching these communities. Can you all dive into that a little bit? Yeah, I'm happy to go first. You know, some of it is, um, we can educate people on all types of safety, but if there's no sidewalks, if there are no places to cross the street, if we continue to close schools uh, and make kids have to go further in order to get education, to me, it, 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 education can only go but so far. It's a feel good campaign um, to make you feel like you've done something. Um, but the reality is um, our communities are, it is hard to implement in those, in, in, in particularly black and brown communities, but it's not the community themselves, it's the community attempting to get through that community. Um, that is why the roads are so wide so people in the suburbs can get through the community. The reason why uh, we are still widening highways in this country is because people are trying to get through the city. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the there's, it, it's compounding issues, but part of it is um, we're, we don't, we are, do we don't have the courage as an industry to make the decisions that we need to make to keep people safe. Um, and that is really looking at a roadway and we've built a road for maybe five hours of the day and the rest of the day, it's a speedway. Um, but it's the courage to reduce or reallocate some of that roadway space for other uses, whether it's better and more improved transit, um, improving sidewalks and, and, and things of those nature. And then I think, again, as the there's the, the land use side of it, of when you look at many black and brown communities, you know, you have the education system where a lot of the public uh, neighborhood schools um, have closed in the name of charter schools. You have um, lack of access to grocery stores. And so people are then having to attempt to go other places to get groceries. So all of that is compounding issues that you see within black and brown communities. And I know Torin shared a map of Ward 7 and Ward 8 in DC. And I lived in Ward 7 um, for a good 15 years. And you know, 
again, it's, you have um, my community, you know, when they tried to reduce the number of lanes, it was the commuters coming from Maryland that are backing up the traffic. It wasn't the Nate, the people that live in Ward 7 and Ward 8. And so I think that is just really why we are struggling um, to get the changes that we need in many communities. Yeah, Thank and you. just to add to Ward 7 and 8, that's a good example. There's one grocery store in Ward 8 for the families there. And if you think about that community, there are not many residents there driving. So to your point, there are more Maryland residents driving through versus the community itself. I think also into um, looking at our underserved communities, the majority of those children are walking to school. And that was my point to highlight that they don't even have what is necessary to walk to school. So in Ward 8, using as an example of Good Hope Road, that's a very heavily trafficked road in the DC area. And we went into that community to help rebuild some of the sidewalk, but we had parents in the middle of the street kind of stop the traffic just for their kids to cross the street. And so for us, it is why we are looking at communities one by one, really to understand the data of how do we prevent the injuries that are happening to children, whether they're walking to school, riding to school, biking to school, making sure that that community understand how to advocate and how we who are working in the transportation can help them advocate. I can guarantee you warts one, two, and three have zebra striping, they have crosswalks, they have beacon lights, they have stop signs that are, they have lights that are telling them wait. But in our black and brown communities, we don't have that and we're last to be served. But then not to bring it up here, Nick, but then we had gentrification where we're moving families out of the cities further out where transportation now becomes harder for them to commute to and from work. Can I add to what one thing Torrin just said that really triggered a thought? Um, you know, I we, we talk about safe routes to school and um, I worked on safe routes to school in Ward 7 and Ward 8. And so the interesting thing that can be missed when you don't uh, work and actually observe um, is that what I found in Ward 7 or 8 versus other parts of, of the city um, is you had to look at safe routes between schools because a lot of what happens in Ward 7 and Ward 8 is the older sibling takes the younger child to elementary school and then continues on their walk. And so even though there had been a concerted effort to make the school, the route to school safer, there's still that gap in between the elementary school and the middle school and the high school. And so that's where, again, it's important to observe those things um, and make sure that we are providing culturally competent solutions to fit that particular neighborhood. Um, yeah, uh, another thing I would, I would add that uh, I think Veronica made a point when she talked about the her, her grandmother's house in Baton Rouge, uh, that one of the things that black and brown communities have suffered from is their communities being destroyed and raised uh, to, 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 to build expressways, to bring people in from the suburbs to the central business district. I was involved in Boston many years ago in the Southwest corridor where, where, where um, uh, we stopped a highway, but the community had already been raised, but the, the, we were able to stop the highway and, had, and went through a whole process of rebuilding the community uh, where there was not an expressway and that we tried to rebuild the community. So there were a vital community with, with uh, you know, a safe uh, road surface road system. That was, uh, so that's an issue that's, that's played Black and brown communities throughout the United States as we built our interstate highway system. Thank, thank you, Dr. Phil. And, and I want to go a little deeper, uh, Veronica, with something you said. You mentioned cultural competent solutions. For someone that may not understand that terminology, can you take us a little deeper with that one and, and give us a little explanation of it? You know, what I'll say is I think sometimes uh, when we think about safety, we can be one trick ponies of this is what we want to do. And it's not that um, people don't want certain things, but it's about what fits this particular community. And, you know, again, as an example, Safe Routes to School, which is a really great program. Um, but again, it's the focus on getting kids from their home to school. But then you miss, in that case, of 
uh, you know, kids moving in between the schools because a older sibling, which is very often what you'll see in certain communities, whether it's black or brown communities, the older sibling is responsible for getting that child to school. And so that's what I mean by, you know, having cultural competency solutions. The other thing that happened, I remember in Ward 8, there was a bike lane project and people were violently against it. But it wasn't that people in Ward 8 don't bike because they do. The frustration was is that you're attempting to talk to me about a bike lane, which yes, I understand will slow traffic down and I can walk across the street, but we ride the bus and the bus isn't showing up on time. If it does show up, it's full. It's all types of foolishness. So can you fix what I need, fix the thing that I am using today? And so that's where I think things can be mixed because you're going in to do a safety project and you're proposing a bike lane and again, people are like, bike link, just the, I just want this thing that you, that's already there to operate better. Um, and so a lot of times, if you can just meet that basic need, you can get to the other stuff, but, it, but you can miss it if you're actually not talking and working with the community. Yeah, thank you. I, Go ahead, Tori. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to add to what Veronica said, and that's where I feel for safe kids. We can't do the work we want to do without starting with the community. And if we want outcomes, we don't, we may drive through. And I love that saying, Veronica, driving through, but we don't live there. We don't work there. And we're coming in making infrastructure changes in communities where families who live there. But I still will say from our community, we don't always know how to advocate for ourselves. And then we have a, we have a mistrust for the government because change has happened to us without us having a, a voice. And, and I, I, I think, you know, I'm happy that, you know, just looking at that one community, if you're in the DC area, it's really an area that I feel is always last. But if you go right across the bridge into the new area of the warp area, it's, it's revitalized. And everything is working for people from Virginia and Maryland to come there to go to the stadiums. But just across the bridge, it's lacking a lot of infrastructure. And this isn't new. I mean, I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C., family live in that community, and that community remains the way it has been for as long as I've been living on this earth. And so I think until we go into communities and give communities a voice, we're going to always continually have this recycle of information that we're talking about today. Thank you, Toreen. And, and as they say in strategic thinking, they say strategy is not a one size fit all. You have to tailor the, fact, the strategy to fit the circumstances in, 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 in a lot of cases. Um, Leah, did you have anything you want to um, add? No, I didn't have anything. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, Toreen, I want to turn to you a, a question that came in. Um, someone that, does, do we have any information? Do we have any information regarding the logic? Uh, let me read the whole question. Speaking of, of design, system design, several cities in my local area, DFW, are building roundabouts, uh, circular structures in the middle of the main of the streets and within neighborhoods. Does anyone have any information regarding the logic behind this seemingly unsafe structures? Anyone want to speak to that? We don't do infrastructure at Safe Kids, but what we do is we do an environmental program where we go in and look at school zones. And that's why I showed in Ward 7 and 8 how we were looking at um, injuries and fatalities around Ward 7 and 8, but also really a specific focus around schools and really understanding how kids get to schools. I will agree with Veronica about um, safe schools, I would say that for us, it's not a one size fit all and every community is different and we have to really understand the community for change. When it gets into infrastructure design, I am working with what is already there. I'm trying, as I said, we have to have a village. That's what we know in our community and in that village, we need to bring the planners. We need to bring the engineers. We need, I mean, not say planners, I mean the city planners. We need to bring the engineers. We need to bring all that could help us make a difference in the community. Yeah, I'll tackle the, the roundabout. Um, you know, there are people who love them and people who hate them. Um, and I'll, I'll say that when designed right, 
um, they can be a really good balance of uh, allowing people in who are driving to continue to flow, uh, allowing people to get across the street safely. Um, and then when really, really done right, having protected areas for people on bicycles. Um, I will say in general, uh, in this particular country, we do them, I mean, I give us a B maybe, <laughs> um, but that's really what they are. And, and in some cases, particularly what we call the little mini roundabouts um, in neighborhoods, it is a way to slow traffic down, particularly when people are um, habitually running stop signs. You know, when you get to these little mini circles or the mini traffic circles, you really do have to slow down in, to, in your approach to them um, versus people will blow through stop signs. So they have their place. Um, they really need to be done right. And they really need to fit the context um, wherever they are being built. Yeah, I've done some transportation planning over the years and roundabouts, uh, as uh, both Veronica and Torin have said, have served, they serve a particular function from the standpoint of reg of, of, of the movement of uh, cars and bicycles and, and pedestrians. And if, if you look at New England roundabouts in New England, people in New England seem to be able to navigate roundabouts a little bit better because they're kind of accustomed to them. Uh, in my neighborhood here in Los Angeles, we just put a roundabout in and people are still trying to figure out how to deal with it because it's, it's something that uh, is not fairly common in Southern California. But uh, roundabouts are designed to serve a specific function to regulate traffic and hopefully improve safety uh, for both the, the bicyclists, uh, car, automobile drivers, and, and pedestrians. But it is, it is kind of regional in terms of how people use them, regional in, in this country. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I have one general question. What can be done to bring awareness to everyday hazards as it pertains to pedestrian crossing, railroad tracks? wheelchairs, et cetera, especially in the black community. Um, anyone? I, I, I'll start off. Nick, ask that question again. <laughs> what can be done to bring awareness to everyday hazards as it pertains to pedestrian crossing, railroad tracks, wheelchairs, especially in the black community? People need to get uh, iPhones out of their hands. Quit, quit, quit watching, looking at their iPhones when they're walking across the street. <laughs> We and say Dr. Hart heads up, phones down. I mean, yeah. we don't have enough time to talk about the railroad tracks and yeah. how they've been built in through our communities. I don't think, um, but what I will say to you is, you know, Safe Kids has a rail safety program and we've been working on rail safety and awareness because of understanding sort of, I would say in communities, black and brown communities where railroad tracks are from pedestrian standpoint, it's a shortcut. It's an easy way to get to and, to and from school, to and from wherever their destination is headed. And so a lot of times that is the reason why they're crossing through the railroad track. Um, again, we talked about lack of sidewalks. So if you're in a community where you don't have that, you know, you're finding the best way or the quickest way or the easiest way to get through. And that's risk. And so that's part of what our program was about. It was really understanding. You can't beat the train. Trains can't see you, you know, you don't hear. And so there's a lot of things that we were educating families to do because families were taking their younger kids. We did a big program through Head Starts because we found where there were railroad tracks and kids take younger children going to school, families were using that path to get to school. So what can be done, Nick, is that, again, we're back to infrastructure, making it safe for families to walk their kids to school and understanding that they shouldn't have to take these barriers to get to where they need to go to. They're barriers. Yeah. And, and I'll say this too, to me, it's who needs to be aware. Uh, people in black and brown communities are, are completely aware that they have no sidewalks. They are aware, you know, even with train tracks, um, you know, here in Houston, we have over 700 at grade crossings. They know that it is a barrier for them and their school's on the other side and they're gonna walk through the train if the train is stopped there. So it's awareness for whom. I think that people are very much aware of what is not in their community. I think it's something that Torrance said earlier is that what they're not aware of is, well, how do I get what I need? What do I do? Who do I call? Who is my council member or alderman or whatever it's going to be called? You know, how do I get, how do I 
communicate my need to someone. But then also we're understanding that many people are in just, I'm trying to get through the day. I mean, how many of us have had a full day and we're like, oh, I got to call the bank. I got to call this. And you get to five o'clock you're like, darn, I didn't get a chance to call the bank. But we also have a privilege of sitting in office jobs. But if you think about people working two, three jobs, you know, working shift work, they're just trying to survive. Like they're literally trying to get through the day. And the fact that there's no sidewalk, the city, y'all should know that there's no sidewalk. Y'all know you didn't put a sidewalk in this neighborhood. So I don't know why you're acting like you don't recognize that there's not a sidewalk there. Why should I, with what little time I have, tell you? And so I think that when we ask these questions, we have to be saying, well, who needs to be aware? And it really is, you know, agencies, um, elected officials, um, people who are in decision-making authorities, they're the ones that not just need to be aware because we're all aware. It is, what are you going to do about that awareness? And so to me, that is really what that conversation is. And I just want to add one also, thing to Nick, that. We need, Nick, we need to, just like we talked about, how do we get more people in the aviation industry? We need more Black young people who want to go into urban planning, transportation planning. I'm going to give a shout out to my university, Morgan State, who has <laughs> a really good transportation program right now. And I am doing my best as an alumni to promote it. But I also want to add one last thing what Veronica said is that can we really start to work on stopping the victim blaming also? Because we're blaming, we we are blaming us for what we do because we don't have access to what we should. So I just want to close with that, Nick. Thank you. We didn't get into that, but that's what happens in our community. We get blamed for it. Yeah. And, and as we go into closing, what I would like to do is probably do a quick round robin. And in a few minutes, this moment is going to become history. Black history 2024 will be over. And um, I would like for each of you to go around, Robin, and share one key takeaway that you would like this audience to remember or act on. Um, I often ask the question when I present is, what do I want you to know? And what do I want you to do? Those two questions. So um, we wanted you to know that transportation safety, it was a very important part of black history. Um, so take it away, Toreen, let's start with you. I will start by saying each one teach one and you learn twice. What can we do to help one another make a difference? Thank you. Leah? Yeah, so I was just gonna mention um, one key takeaway is if you're looking for, and it says uh, FARS data, um, in particular to this uh, race ethnicity data to look at our most recent fact sheet, the 2020 race ethnicity fact sheet. And you can also go to the um, NCSA tools page to gather other data um, or tools. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Uh, I would just uh, say the lessons of the people that I, that I described, Bessie Coleman, James Herman Banning, is that uh, 100 years ago, they were clearly understood they were excluded from the aviation industry, but they said, we don't care, we're going to create our own aviation industry. So self-sufficiency in our community, self-reliance, independence, uh, we can do it if we want to. And those are the lessons I think we need to carry forward. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica? Yeah, so I'm going to say that I think big takeaway is just do better. Um, Leah outlined a bunch of data. The data is there. We can crunch that data five ways from Monday. We can make all the pretty graphs that we want to. We are aware of the problem. So now we have to fix it. So whether you are an engineer, a planner, um, a decision maker, a journalist, whatever you are, in your station, it is you need to do better. Um, we need to put the resources where they need to go. Um, and let's not get caught in paralysis of analysis. We don't need to crunch. We don't need to do anything else. Leah already did the crunching for you. So use her map and go do better. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Veronica. You know, the title of your book reminds me of a saying that uh, if we do not intentionally include, we will unintentionally exclude. This goes double for transportation access and triple for transportation safety. And all of this traces back to our black history. As I said at the onset, the one thing to remember is that history is with us always built into the fabric 
of our transportation system and our road environment. The only way to see a different future is to really, really see our present and to build the future intentionally like everyone just stated. Mayor Angelo tells us that history despite its wrenching pain cannot unveil, unlive, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. So thank you all and here's the history despite its pain, here's the courage, here's the Black History 2024, and here's tomorrow's history, a better history for us all. Again, thank you all and thanks to the panelists. I really appreciate you taking the time to let us uh, sap from your knowledge and your ability. I really appreciate this and uh, have a great day. And this webinar will be is recorded and I'll post it out once we receive the recording in approximately a week. It will be available on our various social media platforms and on our website. And thanks to my team for helping out today and helping us pull this webinar off. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Nicholas.